everyone. Welcome to An Inked Life, Using or Breaking Tradition to Build Authentic Characters with Laila Lee, uh, Sabina Khan, uh, Katie Zhao, and Tanaz Patena. Today we are going to discuss um, how we use our own experiences and our own cultures to write our books, what we infuse our characters with, what our stories um, bring forth. So I hope you will stay and listen to us talk. So let's move on to introductions. Let's start with Lila because she's the first on the screen for me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lila Lee. I'm the author of the Mini Kim series and also young adult books about K-pop and K-dramas. My uh, news release of the script comes out in two weeks. Well, a week, well, two weeks that oh, when like, yeah, or less than two weeks of amount of time this premieres. And it's about a Korean American actress who gets selected to, to star in one of the biggest K-dramas of the year. And um, in order to boost the pop popularity, uh, the staff wants her to uh, fake date her male co-star, but she falls in love with her female co-star instead. So it's a very fun um, book I set in South Korea. And I'm gonna talk about that during this panel. I'll go next. My name is Sabina Khan. I'm the author of The Love and Lies of Roxana Ali, as well as Zara Hussein is here. And my latest is Meet Me in Mumbai, which comes out September 6th. And it's about, it's told in two perspectives of a mother and daughter. When the mother was 17 um, and found herself um, pregnant and alone and facing pretty tough decisions. And the second part is about her daughter when she's almost 18, trying to reconnect with her roots and trying to find out where she fits in in her life. And like Lila, yes, uh, I'm gonna be talking about this more as we chat. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Tanaz Bhathena and I'm a Canadian author of contemporary and fantasy fiction. Uh, my newest books are Hunted by the Sky and Rising Like a Storm. They both form a Y fantasy duology, which is set in a world inspired by medieval India. The story revolves around a girl with a star-shaped birthmark who has been prophesied to be the downfall of Tyrant King and a boy who only ever wants to stay about, out of trouble, but he gets ensnared in her plan for vengeance. The two books contain chosen ones and enemies to lovers romance, fierce female warriors, magical creatures inspired by Indian and Persian mythology, and some very cranky ghosts. <laughs> I can go next. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Zhao. Um, I'm the author of mostly middle grade contemporary fantasy and young adult titles. Uh, my most recent release is called Winnie Zhang. It's the first book, or it's called Winnie Zhang Alicia's a Legend. It's the first book in the Winnie Zhang series, and it follows the adventures of this 12 year old girl named Winnie who is just starting middle school for the first time. And she's really just trying to live an ordinary life. Um, but then one day she finds her deceased grandmother's old cookbook and she makes uh, mooncakes using a recipe from the book. And in doing so, she accidentally unleashes her shaman powers, uh, her grandmother's spirit and some evil spirit. So she's not living a very ordinary life after all. And then my next book um, is releasing in August. It's a young adult thriller with like dark academia vibes. Um, and it's set on a fictional university and it follows the story of a girl named Anna who's starting her freshman year of school at this university. Um, and one of the reasons she chose this university is because of an unsolved murder mystery. Um, it was the case of her old babysitter. And so she's like very curious and wants to try to solve this mystery on her own. Um, but as she gets closer and closer to uncovering the culprit, she realizes that there's somebody who's stalking her and trying to hurt her. So that comes out this August. Awesome. I am Nafisa Azad and I'm the author of The Candle and the Flame and The Wild Ones. And my latest book is of which I don't have a, <laughs> what do you call it, an arc or any visible product, but it's called The Road of the Lost. And it's about a fae, a brownie, which is a fae creature who lives in a forest with a cranky hag and until one day she finds out that she's actually not a brownie 
she has no idea what she is and she has no idea who she is all she knows is that there's a spell on her that is pulling her forward to the fair world and she has to figure out how to break the spell get her figure out what her body is actually looks like and who that fair prince is who keeps on intruding on her dreams in her dreams yeah so that's coming out on october 18th 2022 obviously 2022 <laughs> so let's move on to our discussion about um experiences books writing and all that where shall we launch off with a question that sounds good okay let's see the questions that lila sent us um what aspects of your culture, our culture, do you find yourself unconsciously adding to your characters and stories? But is there anything that, you know, like every time you write a book, it's even, it might be unconscious. You, you just write it down. For me, it's the food. <laughs> I was actually talking to one of my friends about how like we Asians like we like are really like into our food it's part of our culture like we have family gatherings that revolve around food we have like friend meetups like around food so even if I don't think about it like um I feel like I always incorporate like Asian food into my stories okay. um I know like what one of my um author friends she was telling me that like apparently her editor had to give her a note to like reduce the number of cute Korean cafes she like included in her book so it's like a almost like a pathological problem but you know I mean it's we're all about food it's such an important part of culture mm-hmm. that's why I personally like always like I don't think about like, putting it into my book mm-hmm. yeah I do I do that too I mean I don't even think about it it comes naturally like I feel like food and you know f- food just kind of provides this sort of central um, like like a, a, a focus so that people can gather around and share stories and just be excited about each other's cultures and because even from like I'm from Bangladesh but p- my mom's family is from Pakistan and even we have different food I mean even though it's you know South Asian but my husband is from a different part of India so there we have different foods complete like different cuisines different you know ingredients we use and different like things we get excited about different street foods and I think it's such a wonderful way to introduce readers to this um, you know still fairly kind of you know newish uh, type of um, uh, cuisine I mean people like in Canada of course there are a lot of Indian restaurants and everything but they're not they don't encompass everything that you, we grew up eating. And it's just, I think also for, for me, like I didn't grow up in Canada or in the States. I grew up in Bangladesh, but I've introduced my kids to these kinds of foods and they're just as excited as I used to be when I was younger. And, you know, you go out and eat the street foods that your parents always tell you not to eat because it'll give you stomach problems, <laughs> but you do it anyway. But there's all these memories attached mm-hmm. to food and, it's really hard for me not to write about it because, and the other, you know, one of the reasons also is that when I, when I started reading young adult, people never eat. It's always, like, why does the, why does the main character not eat? Yeah. You know, they do all these things. They, they just don't eat. And I, I think just describing food and the, the process of preparing a meal with your family, it, it shows so much. It's such a great way to share the family relationships and, mm-hmm. you know, like the vibe in the family and stuff yeah. like that. I agree too. If, if I feel like um, food somehow becomes a different language that you use to propel your um, plot forward, um, it's it's interesting because in Fiji we have these um, wedding food. I'm sure you guys all can understand when I say there's wedding that one whiff of a particular dish brings you back to that wedding, your cousin's wedding that you had to sit through. <laughs> we have uh, a pumpkin and puri. That's like we every time I smell that, even when my mom makes it at home, I'm like, oh, that's that's wedding food we are having. Who's getting married today? Um, I also find that food is very evocative. Um, you can say so much by by the things your um, your character serves, cooks for someone else, or their mom gives to them. Yeah. And food is such a wonderful way to um, to just show culture without actually going into details about it I also um personally I also add color to my um books I find that um it's uh, unconscious because you know think of a think of a um, market like a bazaar and then you have all that color come to life so 
where, whichever book I write, even if it's just a passing mention, I will have a market because it's 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 something that I've experienced and I want to share that with my readers. Yeah, Dines? Um, For me, definitely. Um, food w- was something, I think it's true that it was unconscious for me because I didn't even realize how much food I was putting into Hunted by the Sky until all the readers kept saying that, oh my God, you're making us hungry. <laughs> with, by mentioning all these kachoris and all these things going on I'm like oh I must have been hungry while I was writing these books I'm not sure really I just put that in another thing that I tend to do unconsciously is use um, words from an Indian language in mm-hmm. my English language mm-hmm. narrative it just comes in mm-hmm. so it's like most of the times my editor will be like can we ex- can you explain this and I'll be like mm-hmm they'll figure it out through context. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we always have this little tug of war. But yeah, uh, most of the time, that's that's what happens all the time because I'm thinking in two different languages, sometimes mm-hmm. even three different languages at the same time. So it's like, it comes in when you're just writing. And sometimes, you know, you have to speak in that mixed language mm-hmm. for you, the reader to get the joke too. So it's that sort of thing that happens unconsciously for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think food is also like, it's a good way to show bonding between characters. And that was something that I like, I, I, it was a deliberate choice that I made in Winnie to incorporate like lots of different kinds of Chinese foods. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also was a choice that felt very natural because uh, I wanted this book specifically to feel like it was coming from um, a place of experience and home, which is where like I was writing from. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to write a book that kind of reflected my own childhood, mm-hmm. um, but like, you know, I, I didn't have the magic, but besides that, like the the food and the experiences, the bonding with family through food, like that was something that I wanted to incorporate in this. Um, I just like remember when I was younger, uh, my grandparents would come visit from China and my, my Chinese was never like super good. Um, it's even worse now than it used to be. So like sometimes like they, they would say things to me and like I would always be able to understand but sometimes I couldn't like figure out how to like phrase mm-hmm. words properly um, when I was speaking to them but I always felt like by like spending time together like making food like we didn't necessarily have to talk or anything like mm-hmm. in that sense like we were communicating and mm-hmm. um, it was just like a really great way to like be able to bond and show love to each other. Mm-hmm. like food becomes a language in which you yeah um, the love language food. almost yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so are there things that you have decided not to put like from your culture like no culture is perfect so is are there things that you have decided no that I will avoid um you know what uh I think about that a lot when I'm writing but I also feel like to represent your culture as flawless seems really fake. Like it doesn't mm-hmm. feel like authentic and there are ugly parts in every culture. And it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that in somehow through conversation, through dialogue, that it's not just my culture that does this, like, you know, mm-hmm. similar things happen in different forums. But mm-hmm. I think it's, I don't know. I mean, I'm, we're writing young adult. I mean, we're not, right. It's I'm, we're writing fiction, but not fairy tales necessarily, or, mm-hmm. you know, like we're not pretending that everything's, you know, so perfect, because then I feel like the characters would seem unrealistic, you know, like, mm-hmm. how do you, uh, for example, like, in, in just specifically in my book, I'm writing, like, my first two book both have queer protag- protagonists from a Muslim family, and I consciously made the decision to show, you know, in, in The Love and Lives of Roxana Ali, the parents were awful, which is also realistic, but in The Love and, uh, in Zara Hussein is here, the parents were amazingly supportive, which is also realistic. So I really wanted to, like, I wanted to show that, you know, there is this sort of, you know, spectrum of, of reactions and of, of parenting styles and relationships. And I just feel like it would be, I, I feel like I'd be lying to my readers if I just pretended that, oh, this, you know, my culture is so perfect. I'm only going to show mm. all the beautiful parts of it because nobody should think anything bad about my, where I come from. But I just, I, I just don't feel like, I, I really would feel like I, I'm just lying to everybody because that's not reality. That's not how the world is in any mm-hmm. culture, you know? So definitely, but it's something I have to say, uh, it's something I struggle with and I always have to rethink and over and over again to make sure that I'm not doing, I'm not, I, that I don't feel like I'm doing something bad 
yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a struggle. It's really mm. an internal struggle, and I, I don't think it's gotten easier from book to book. I think it's just going to be there, and it's just something I'll have to wrestle with every time I write, depending on the story. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like sometimes I might not um, speak about a certain element, or because I feel like my book cannot fully encompass the nuance of the issue. And I'd, and I'd hesitate to even mention it because I would be doing it the whole thing in injustice if I can't fully get into, um, for example, faith, because faith is very strong, but like for Western readers, faith, faith is not something you discuss all that much because, you know, God, it's, I feel like it's very personal. So mm-hmm. I, try, I tend not to get into that as much, except for the first book in which I was like, yeah, I just went all out. So yeah, I, that's the reason I would uh, um, um, abstain, but I agree with uh, Sabina because there's certain things, for example, the stigma against um, seeking mental help. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a big thing in uh, mm-hmm. Asian cultures. I feel, I feel like even, in, even especially in mine too. So I feel like I'd want to talk about it and showcase uh, seeking counseling or you know going to a shrink in uh, positive terms just to you know just to show that it's not a bad thing through fiction yeah yeah i feel like um for my books it's definitely like similar to Sabina's books where uh korean culture is very heteronormative and all my characters like queer so i can't think of anything i avoid talking about uh, maybe i should be more careful but <laughs> um i think i approach it more of a like i try to challenge the norms so like, for example and i'll be the one Mm-hmm. Um, I had a plus size character who goes against the Korean beauty norms. And then in um flip the script, I have um a queer couple, a sapphic couple that goes against like the constructs of like a heteronormativity that like Korean culture like has. Whereas like like I think I actually bring it up in like one of the scenes in flip the script where like she's watching TV and all the commercials have like a very nuclear mom, dad, child family. And like that's kind of like what's like seen as normal in Korea, and that's what for me I really want to challenge through my writing. Mm-hmm. When you when you said um, challenge the beauty beauty standard, I, I was reminded of Hwasa from Mamamoo. Mama mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> do you remember what she says where she's like, if uh, I if my body doesn't meet the standards of uh, uh, right, Korea, and yeah, and she like, and like Mamamoo they get so much hate because. Like, yeah, they're like, oh, how dare you, like, speak out against, like, the nor- norms. And it's, like, there's so much backlash that these, like, feminists and, like, get in Korea. Yeah, it's a whole other <laughs> topic. A whole other topic, yeah. Yeah. So who hasn't spoken? Um, I, okay, I was trying to think. I don't think I actively avoid anything in my books. Um, but I guess, in general, I try to avoid things that, I feel like might be perceived as stereotypes Mm -hmm. so like uh when I like like try to like create characters I try not to make them this might sound come off wrong but like not like super math and science oriented which Mm -hmm. I think is a stereotype Mm -hmm. that's often like put on Asians Mm -hmm. um but actually Mm -hmm. I I've like found I've come to this across this like interesting conflict I guess where um I've gotten reviews from like like the trade review publications uh where once I think twice actually they said um it feels like these characters in like one of my books is like like, based off of stereotypes or like depicts like stereotypes of Asian culture and it then like the examples they would list would just be stuff like like eating the food or like like I think like wanting to do good in school and stuff like that so now I found like there's like this whole interesting thing where like no matter how much I try to think about what could be a stereotype that I'm trying to avoid reviewers I don't know just like have these perceptions that like stereotypes are automatically bad and Mm -hmm. like like we should like criticize them always Mm -hmm. so I don't know I don't know if anyone this has happened to anyone else but it's just something I've noticed it does Uh, sometimes it it happens all the time sorry about that Uh, I just wanted to say that it happens all the time and you know this is something that I want to say that um, someone else's stereotype may very well be my reality Mm -hmm. yeah so that is that is something that is something that I had to deal with uh, especially when I was writing my first two books and um, 
um, especially from a second book and all that as well, I showed a very, very smart girl who was doing really well in school, but she really wanted to be an artist and her parents wanted her to be a doctor or an engineer. And it's like, you know, that sort of stereotype. Again, people are saying this is a stereotypical thing. I live that stereotype. I, I'm a product of that stereotype. So it's that sort of thing. I, um, I've come to a point now, at least uh, for myself, that I will write the story that I want to tell mm-hmm. and I will let yeah. my characters mess up because to be honest, they're teenagers. They are going to mess up. And I will not shy away from exploring difficult topics if mm-hmm. they need to be explored. I do, I am conscious like Nafisa is about certain topics. If if I'm adding too many heavy topics into a book, maybe I can't give one more justice than the other. So then I try to sort of, you know, shorten things out or something. But for the most part, I don't try to restrict myself. I just go all out. And then I see what can be condensed, what needs to be really uh, included to propel the story forward. Mm-hmm. And what story am I trying to tell? That's mm-hmm. the question that I always ask myself with every single book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to quickly go back to the language thing, you know, um, like we were talking about, uh, like Tanaz was saying, like putting, you know, putting different language words into into the book. And this is something um, in my first book, I put a little bit of Bengali, just very little, because the parents are immigrants. So, of course, they do speak Bengali amongst each other, even though they're speaking English with the kids. It's hard not to include that. I mean, everyone, you know, most immigrants will speak some sort of a hybrid version mm-hmm. of their language with English, right? And I got a lot of uh, a lot of reviewers saying that, oh, you know, like who speaks like that? And it's not just the language, it's also the grammar. Like the, the phrasing is different mm-hmm. when you're translating in your head from another language, from your mother tongue mm-hmm. into English. The phrasing is not going to be exactly American, mm-hmm. uh, but that's how they speak. Like when, when I'm writing these characters, I'm literally hearing my cousins and my uncles and my parents, their voices, how they spoke, how I grew up listening to them speak English. And I, I do get a lot of comments, well, not directly, but in reviews saying that, oh, you know, who speaks like that? It sounds so odd. The dialogue so weird. And so my response to that was to put even more <laughs> into the next book. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? I mean, people need to realize that not everybody speaks English in an American in English you know, way. <laughs> yeah, not Amer- yeah. not everybody speaks English American English. I mean, people speak even within the in like even within South Asia, there are so many differences in how yeah. uh, people speak English, right? Mm-hmm. Like Bengali people speak different. Uh, a different style than people from Pakistan. And, and that's, you know, they're like, their mother tongues are completely different. So of course their interpretation in English will be also different. And so it's, it's really um, infuriating when people just assume that that's nobody talks like that. No, I find it's interesting because it feels like when we code, I think that's what it's called coding uh, English and our, our native languages that um, the Ryan becomes a different language altogether, which, which mm-hmm. is, which is similar to, but not exactly English or the lang- mother language, our mother language. And it's mm-hmm. different for every, each each variant is different from uh, um, depending on the mother language. So mm-hmm. I find that very interesting. Uh, one more thing that I'd like to put out, uh, according to um, Katie's uh, comment about, you know, the trade reviews, what irritates me to no end is when um, the, the Insta love comment, <laughs> when you were like, no, it's not Insta love, it's attraction that's what happens you see someone they attract yeah. you immediately if it doesn't it's happen something. in the first in the first scene it's not going to happen that's <laughs> chemistry you know yeah. so it just irritates me because my both books they're like insta love i'm like it's not insta love <laughs> hey, hey don't knock insta love i mean i'm all for it it's all about the feels <laughs> lust insta attraction yeah, I mean, and then you give your uh, characters time to, you know, know the person, see what kind of tea they like, you know, if, it, if they like tea, if they don't like tea, there's going to be no compatibility. <laughs> hey, I rhymed. <laughs> 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 Moving on. I guess I've become the um, moderator. <laughs> um, so the second question is, it's an interesting one that I'd like to know your answers to. Um, what is an aspect of your culture that is at odds with Western, Western sensibilities? Um, this is, um, the example I gave is when, we, you know, when um, a, a kids talk to elders, they don't talk back, no matter how infuriating the elders are, you know, like, you just, I wish I could just punch them, but, you know, <laughs> if, if it's set in uh, 
a different uh, um, setting other than uh, North America, well, even in North America, I, I can't imagine, you know, being like, you shut up. I'd be like, you know, oh, yeah, yes. it's <laughs> true. Yeah. So is, is there any like, have you noticed in your writing any aspect of uh, your culture that, you know, the white people just can't get? The shoes, <laughs> the shoes. No, I was about Take to say it that. off the shoes before you enter my house yeah. and bring your dirty shoes into my house. It's like, why is that not just a normal thing for everyone, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, what Nafisa was saying about uh, how you react to your to your parents and your elders, no matter how infuriating they are. Like in in my first book, this is one of the biggest things I've gotten biggest like not backlash, but comments where they're saying, you know, uh, when Roxana finds out that her parents are tricking her and trying to get her married off, she mm. ma manages to come back to Seattle. And people are like, why, did she, why didn't she just leave? Why did she come back to her home? And I'm like, because they're her family mm. and they're being horrible and they're being awful. That's true, very true. But it's not that easy for a teenager, for a 17 year old to just say, okay, bye. I don't like what you're doing. <laughs> I'm just going to leave. That's not how things work. I don't think that's how things work even here. Mm -hmm. Like even even with non-Muslim, non-Bengali parents, I don't think it's so easy to just leave because they're being hateful. I think mm -hmm. it takes a lot of courage and a lot of like really being pushed into a corner, which of course, I mean, you know, nobody should have to uh, bear or tolerate abuse, even if it's at the hand of their parents. I'm obviously not yeah. saying that, but she's, that's not going to be her first instinct to just like, like her first instinct was to get away from Bangladesh because she felt powerless over there. She feels more at home in Seattle where she grew up and she has friends and resources, but she's not just going to move out and go somewhere else right away. I mean, she's going to try. And so I was so surprised when people's reactions were like, why did she even bother? Why did she, you know, why didn't she just leave them? And so that was something I, I think would be very, very difficult for a child of immigrants or, you know, an immigrant, a teenage immigrant to just, you know, um, tell the whole world the problems she's having at home. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very strong sense of like, keep stuff, you know, keep family stuff in the family type of thing. And obviously mm -hmm. that's not always a good thing, but it is what it is. I mean, that's, I think if you've been raised like that, your first instinct isn't going to go running off to someone and just blurting out all your, you know, secrets. I think there is some hesitation there and you know even though you're pushing back I think the instinct is to try and fix things before you give up on your family mm -hmm. and so that was something I found yeah. kind of I I, ne I didn't yeah. expect that so I, I was surprised by that mm -hmm. yeah building off of that Sabrina um I, I've also like sort of tried to like emphasize family and the family unit in my books because mm -hmm. like something that I've always kind of observed um the difference between like Western and non-Western cultures is that like in Western cultures, individualism is like heavily yeah. emphasized. And, you know, once you turn 18, you're, you're basically on your own. You go off to college, you live, you know, alone away from your family. Um, then you're expected to just like sort of start your own family after that. Um, and that's like not really something that I see with uh, my relatives, like who live in China. Um, like when I go visit them, they all pretty much live together. It's like everybody, like cousins and um, grandparents and, you know, people, even like people who are married um, will often like stay within like the family unit. Um, and so like family is seen as like really just like a community where you can't, you can't just like leave, even if you are having problems, like, um, and yeah, like sometimes that can become toxic. So that's like a whole different discussion. But um, family still is like, just like heavily emphasized um, and seen as like very important. And, you know, even if you have like problems, you try to work through them because yeah. it's your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, my books definitely deal with that as well, because I think the biggest thing that like, I can predict people not being able to relate with Hannah and flip the script is that um, celebrity culture in America is very different from celebrity culture in Asia and in Korea because in Korea it's the whole co collectivist mindset where it's like uh, prioritizing your family it, it branches outward to like uh, um, prioritizing society and community as a whole um, it's, very, it's very interesting because in America like Kanye West like Kim Kardashian all those people like they do whatever they want because they're celebrities and so, like I have the money I can use it like, if wanted but in Korea or different Asian countries um so 
being a celebrity means you have a responsibility that you have like obligation to like in return for fan support you have to be like a good role model or you have to be like good member of the community and there's that sense that like I feel like um kind of branches off from that like a uh, family dynamic to like a whole bigger dynamic and so in my book uh, Hannah even though she's like a, this like pop actress and she's like her friends like a k-pop star and all that stuff like they ha- they function and like um they they like um they undergo like their lives um under close scrutiny but also like kind of like internal pressures to like always like conform to what society expects them to do which I, th- I don't think mm-hmm. it's like really something that American celebrities would would deal with. <laughs> I think I think it's something like noblesse oblige where the um um no, aristocrats have a I have are have to be good to the commoners because they are in that they receive their um money or you know right the, and, yeah and, yeah so it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um Katie said what I had to say about you know the <sighs> community versus um community versus the individual um, I find that a lot of times I tend to write as we instead of I, and that is basically and in continuation of that um, community um, um, mindset that we, you know, when I moved from uh, Fiji to Canada, it, t- it took me a while to like when people asked me what my favorite color was, and I'd be like, my favorite color. Like before, it was our favorite color is blue, but now I get to d- decide what my favorite color is. It was it was an interesting process where you sort of cleave away from um, your family unit, your community, and then become your own person, and that is good and also bad in some some ways. But yeah, I, I get that. Um, that also face, you know, <laughs> sometimes people will keep things, even bad things to themselves because they don't want to lose face. I, I'm sure you guys um, have the same experience or like, even if, you know, something bad has happened, they're like, no, we will not tell anyone because yeah. we will lose face. You know, mm. what will it's people say? Right. The family's yeah. reputation mm-hmm. and in the, they're standing in the community. And, and I mean, that's, like you said, there it's good in some ways and bad in some ways. I mean, you have the support and everything. Like, ideally, mm. if you are in trouble, you would have. To, if you're part of a you know a, a bigger family unit, you mm. would hope that they would support you. But unfortunately, sometimes that can work against you, mm. where you know if you're too outside the norm, mm. or the perceived norm, then all of a sudden even your own family unit could turn against you. So I mean, there's you know the, the pros and cons of that. But it's definitely so interesting how certain, like, I, I mean, I can just speak for myself here, but like when I'm writing certain things, when something hadn't even occurred to me and then I hear it mentioned in a review, I'm so surprised still, like different things, I'm so surprised, like really that's what they took from that, you know? It's it's just so, I don't know, it's very eye-opening <coughs> is what it is. Mm-hmm. Did Az, you have something to say? <coughs> you all pretty much literally elaborated (laughs) so well on that and you know the the one thing that I was thinking of uh, building off the conversation is um that I and I think it was touched on before as well the idea of mental health Mm. in South Asia and it's like you know uh, from my first book a girl like that um uh the main character's aunt suffers from mental illness and there would be reviews and they would be like why aren't they doing anything about it it's clear she's suffering from mental health illness and I'm like you know, mental health is treated very differently mm. from an Indian perspective than it is from an American perspective. And it's really, it's really a stigma and it's, it's a problem. And that's, I think I was trying to highlight the problem over there and I was not giving any solutions because that is the problem that nobody is trying to seek these solutions in this particular context. And another thing that is sometimes at odds with um, Western sensibilities is the fact that we give relationship tags to strangers who are not our bro- brothers. Uh, so everybody is an a- auntie. auntie and uncle or brother uh, or sister. Yeah. I mean, uh, even, if, uh, even if I'm going uh, in India and uh, I'm hailing a cab, I'll be like, oh, bhaiya or brother, take yeah. me here, take me there. You know, that sort of thing. So um, in uh, Hunted by the Sky, I do this 
all the time in my books. In Hunted by the Sky, it was very purposeful. Um, there's a group of rebel women called the Sisterhood of the Golden Lotus. And mm -hmm. uh, the girls in the group call the leader Didi or Elder Sister. But apart from giving a little translation of what that meant, I allow the reader to interpret that they feel close to this older woman, even though they're not related mm -hmm. by blood. So that's something that I allow the readers to interpret. I don't really explain that it's a cultural thing or anything. I'm like, let the reader take from it what they will. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like this 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 person has a big family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's so confusing. I mean, sometimes you know because like you were saying, they're not sure if this person is related and so you do have to explain sometimes even to your editors and your agents yeah. and stuff and so it it can be like but that's how it is. And so I mean, you can, you know, there is such a thing as over explaining, right? Like no, you don't want to yeah have like the whole chapter of just I mean if you start explaining you could have like a lot of chapters just explaining stuff so yeah yeah but that's yeah. a really lovely I love that about our about my culture you know that that you do you you I don't know what it is it makes you feel some sort of a warmth a connection to somebody who's a complete stranger and and also respect right like if you have an, mm -hmm. an older person even if it's a shopkeeper, somebody behind the counter, you just address them. It's it's a it's a it's a form of respect, and it well, creates a different di dialogue, right? When you're treating people with respect. Sorry, Nafisa. Very no, true. I said I was like, but you know, when you're being addressed as auntie, I'd be like, really? <laughs> you call me, but you're like that's different. Like <laughs> I'm like I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the the flip side is that you know even when um in talking to even treating with people who are older than me I always feel like saying auntie and then or like sister and then I feel bad because I'm like you know I my, I've been conditioned so well by my parents to not call my elders by my name by their names that even with Sabina I'd be like yeah I'm, I'm calling you Sabina I'm but not I'm that much older than you Nafisa <laughs> 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 you no know, it's even two years ago okay? you're not know, supposed to know. call them sister absolutely yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm absolutely. like sister Sabina <laughs> <laughs> anyway the next question is my favorite because i know we can throw a lot of tea um how much or how little do you worry about perceptions of readers and your own communities when you write about your cultures both the positive and the negative aspects of it you oh. have the four <laughs> <laughs> that's tenas go ahead sorry um oh, okay i i do worry to some extent i mean I do want as wide an audience as possible to understand what I'm trying to do in my books without also pandering to the Western gaze. So that's kind of like a balancing act that I have to do all the time. And I also want things to be as accurate as possible in terms of the words, terminology, the spelling, et cetera. But I also like to play with language a little bit. And uh, in Hunted by the Sky, I made this uh, little joke where I named a horse Rat, which means night in Hindi. And one of the characters in the book says, good night, Rat. And uh, so good night, night. And it's even mentioned in the book sort of that it's a joke. A somewhat pedantic reader uh, from India had issues with this. They said I was pulling a chai tea moment. And that, that kind of made me mad. <laughs> so um, I was like, can you not take a joke? But more recently, I came across a video by uh, Indian politician and author Shashi Tharoor. Mm -hmm. He's basically like the dictionary himself when it comes to the English language. And he said that we need to stop taking everything so seriously when it comes to language. I mean, there are words that are used in India that are not either Indian or British in origin. For example, the word brinjal, which means eggplant to the rest of the world. It doesn't have, uh, the word doesn't have any Indian language origin or British origin. So it may have come from a completely different language. But the point is that language changes and you can mm -hmm. have fun with it too. Absolutely. Uh, so while I am sensitive to what my readers think, especially readers from my culture, I think it's also important for us as writers to be creative and let our characters break tradition if they so choose. That's a really I think I used question. to worry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Katie, please. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I think I used to worry so much about how my books would be perceived in the beginning. So, like with my debut, The Dragon Warrior, which is a middle grade Chinese inspired fantasy with lots of Chinese mythology. Um, I was like so worried that I would get like a, a, a very tiny detail wrong about mythology and some reader would pick up on it and make like a whole big deal about it and criticize it and you know I, I didn't get criticized for any of that but I would get criticized for 
like things I didn't think I got wrong, which was um, people saying like, oh, this feels like a stereotype of Chinese culture. <laughs> no, I'm just writing from my experience. <laughs> like, sorry, that's offensive to you. Um, but I think like going through that process made me realize, oh, readers are going to like have opinions and criticize no matter what, um, no matter like how much you research and how careful you are. And I think as long as we as authors, like just like, you know, do our due diligence and write our stories that we want to tell, make sure like nothing is harmful in the book. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the best we can do. And, you know, however it's like received and perceived is how it's perceived. But no, I, I don't feel like I worry too much about um, how readers, like even Chinese readers perceive my books anymore because I understand like all of us come from different backgrounds and experiences and someone's opinion of your book um, doesn't really reflect anything on you so much as like how it reflects um, their understanding of the book based on where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To go off on that, I feel like I need, I always need to point out that just because you don't like a book doesn't make it bad. It just mm -hmm. means you don't like a book. Yeah. Uh, people tend to get confused about this. If they don't like a book, it's trash. <laughs> so um, I have never worried about what, how my readers are going to perceive my book. <laughs> <laughs> because um, in the kennel and the flame, I use like multiple languages, words from multiple languages, because I was like, you know, I'm not going to put any of it in italics because they don't need to be. If you're reading the story, if you want a, a story of a multicultural um, a country, you know, with many different kinds of people, that's what you're going to get. And that is as realistic as I can make it. And with uh, the wild ones, oh my God, the wild ones, that was, that was an interesting journey because that book is so... Um, it's so raw. It, I, I just, um, I went in uh, with a um, agenda and I, I, with an agenda, I was going to talk about females and feminism from a women of color, from the perspective of women of color. And I was not going to give a damn about how the West felt about it. And in it, there's actually uh, a piece where it says, um, there, there are urinals in France shaped like female lips. If you don't have a problem with that, stop reading this book so my editor didn't tell me to take it out so I was like you know I might as well keep it I I feel like um to get the emotional um authenticity in your book across to the readers you have to be true and you cannot pander to anyone's expectations because once you start doing that other than yourself um once you start pandering to um expectations of readers you mm -hmm. will start going diverging from your original um what your original route or what whatever you wanted to do so you tell a story you tell how you tell it being as true to yourself as you can and then if the reader mm -hmm. likes it that's great if they don't you try again eventually mm -hmm. they'll like a book by you right yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like um, what's the point if oh sorry <laughs> no, 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 go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead go ahead katie it was just to be a quick point. I, I was just going to say, like, what, what's the point of all this if we're just trying to cater to, like, what other people want and not, like, writing from our hearts? Because I don't, I'm sure, like, we all started because we, like, genuinely just love writing and mm -hmm. feel like we have stories to tell. And so what's the point of all this if we're not being our authentic selves? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think when I was writing Roxana, I was so scared because it was, you know, a, a, a Muslim lesbian. I mean, just that it wasn't something that, you know, there weren't a lot of books out and I was so scared to, you know, to put it out there, but I also wanted to put it out there. And I was worried about a lot of things and a lot of things were, you know, I was right to worry about them because there were a lot of comments, but there were comments about the, the, par the parents not being believable because nobody would treat their daughter like that. And then there were comments about like, how could you, you know, why are you representing your own culture in such a way? And so at, at, I think at the end, and then there were also comments where people were like, my God, I'm a Muslim Bengali lesbian. I really connected with this book. Mm. So it's like you get, so those, you know, I, I kind of tried to focus on that, that, you know, there's going to be somebody who will connect and who will understand and who will feel seen and all that. Um, and I think at some point while I'm writing, I think at some point my brain just shuts that part of it off where mm. like everyone else, or like all of you have said, like you can't write the story that you want to write if you're constantly going to listen to that voice mm. that's telling you, oh, you know, this might be a problem and that might, there's so much. And, you know, um, I'm on my third, like I'm on my fourth, I'm writing my fourth book now and I still 
think about these things. You know, I'm still worried about these things, but I think there's no way to make everyone happy. I mean, you, if you, you know, if you try to um, avoid something or include mm. something that someone else will get upset, you know, and I think you just have to write what's in your heart and what, what the story you want to tell and hope, hope that, you know, a lot of people do like it and that at least you feel like you've done, you've been honest in your writing and that you've done a good job. And I think that's all we can do. I mean, we can't control what other people will think, you know, um, and I don't think that's our job. I don't think we should, I mean, aside from writing, obviously harmful and horrible, hateful stuff, just in general, I, I don't think we can control and that we, that it's, I don't think we have, we can worry about it that much. Cause then really like, I feel like I'd just stop writing because I'd be so afraid yeah. of what people might say and what people might think about my stories. Right. So at some point, I think you have to just tell yourself, kind of separate yourself from that, mm -hmm. that path, I guess. Um, yeah, I definitely wish I'd been braver sooner <laughs> because I feel like, oh, um, I mean, I know like among the author community, we always talk about imposter syndrome. And like mm -hmm. for me, I never mm -hmm. had an imposter syndrome about being an author because it's something I always wanted to do as a kid. And I feel like I spent like decades trying to be an author. So I'm like, okay, I'm fine, find an author. But I feel like I, I always had imposter syndrome for like being like neither Korean nor American because even though I was born mm -hmm. in Korea, I was raised primarily in America. And even though I go to Korea like pretty often, like it's not the same as like growing up in Korea itself. And I think that imposter syndrome was so bad that like for the longest time I really resisted writing a book set in Korea. <laughs> and uh -huh. um, which is funny because like uh and that's why I'll be the one I said it in LA, because I was I knew LA like I I, did, I went to school in LA. Um and so I had all that all that, but I think seeing other Korean American um uh, authors who like no shade at all but they were less korean than me because they were all born and, and raised in america writing books about like korean culture and sending korean maybe make giving the confidence to like oh mm -hmm. what if they can do that i can that too so mm -hmm. um just just like, reading all those books and from um other diasporic authors like kind of gave me the courage to write my own books which is why i put the scripts in korea mm -hmm. but also i i want i want to be more i want to be respectful in that in the sense that like i never want to like pretend I know how it feels to grow up in Korea so I wanted to do it in the perspective of like a Korean American girl who got get whisks off to mm -hmm. um South Korea and has to deal with it there because that's something I can, I can definitely relate to who hasn't spoken to Ness I think I spoke I yes, in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on to the second last question what have you learned about yourself through your journey as an author not as a writer, but as an author. You know, we, we don't discuss the fact that being a writer is so very different from being an author. I feel like being an author is much more challenging than just being a writer where you yeah. can you know, not worry about anyone who's reading your work because you're just writing. But as an author, you have to do so much more. So go okay, ahead. I'll, I'll go because <laughs> you asked me last. <laughs> so I am learning to be more confident in mm. my choices as a writer as an mm. author mm. so especially when it comes to including or excluding parts of my culture in a book um, early on I too had that imposter syndrome mm. when my books were coming out I'd be really very afraid about what readers were thinking and I tried to accommodate but then you know I started getting those voices in my head and I'm like I can't write my book this way mm. I was I'd, I'd lose part of my identity if that con continued mm. so these days while I do pay some attention to reviewers, I also do what makes me happy. While it's true that my books are going out to the general public, the first person I'm writing for is myself. If I'm not happy, you're not going to read the book. Mm -hmm. So that's how it goes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Who wants to go next? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> I, I found as, as a Muslim who has been seeing her uh, faith, you know, in the news, um, maligned in the news. I feel like I have been filtering myself to make myself palatable to audiences who might otherwise be um, hostile to my identity, to where I come from, because I want them to read my books. I'm like, look, I like puppies too. You know, I'm just the same as you. Or look, um, I eat fries, you know, something to make myself um, easily to um, relate with, to be empathized with. And you know what, after this um, last uh, Ramadan, I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done being, being, making myself, you know, relatable or um, 
filtering myself to make myself palatable if you don't want to read my books because i am muslim yeah. that's up to you that's that's your um mm. bias that's your discrimination and by tree, not mine so this is what i've, I've learned to be stronger as an author mm. because i feel like you, you cannot yeah. survive if you don't have a thick skin if you don't grow some calluses in your um in your heart because people will take your walk and sometimes they will just you know shred it no matter what intent you write it with no matter mm. how well you intend it it's it's all fair play and that's fine because you put it out there but as an author i've learned to take a step back yes this is my walk but i, I it's already done i am not attached to it it has already left my body like you know like when you fling your children out of like go live your life because <laughs> i want to <you> die <laughs> <laughs> go <laughs> go yeah definitely for me too like being more confident being more brave being braver because I feel like I think it's because I also spent a long time querying and getting rejected like I like spent like eight years wow. getting rejected by agents and then two more years getting rejected by editors so by the time I actually had a book I was like what people want to actually read my books so I feel like a lot of my journey has been like um you know I, I mean I've only been like a professional author for like two years now so I'm pretty new but like I think for me a lot of it has been more confident being more confident in my writing and learning mm -hmm. that lesson yeah yeah I mean people I, don't discount that writing is always a learning process you don't just mm -hmm. you know st I mean if you are lucky you don't unless you're lucky you don't start off by being amazing you walk yeah. your way up to it <laughs> yeah what's well, being an author too like just having social media presence and like be on tiktok yeah. and <laughs> yeah. as Katie I also I was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i don't even know where to begin i feel like being an author has taught me like so much more than pretty much like any other like period of my life i can think of um, I mean, like appearance wise, it taught me how to dye my hair. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> like I do my own hair now. And that's it's just, awesome. Were you dye your own match. hair? Like I said, that you did it yourself? Yeah, I do my own hair. Yeah, teach me. Wow. Later, awesome. later. It does. Because I was dropping like hundreds of bucks per session in like the hair salon. And I was like, I can't afford to do this for every book that I'm going to yeah. put out. So I was like, I'm just going to like, like get some dye online um i, I need to talk like, after this <laughs> we'll, we'll talk we'll talk i'll teach you my ways um i mean there's that like um as I, lila said uh there's like just learning how to use social media because before being an author i was like i was i used social media very minimally i think i had an instagram but um i i didn't even do like an annual post like i never used it I think Twitter, I was more active on just because I wanted to find like other writers. But again, that was because I wanted to get into the industry. I really only use like Facebook. <laughs> um, but yeah. then, you know, being an author now, it's just like the industry is just so saturated um, with like new voices coming in all the time. It's so hard to set yourself apart unless, mm -hmm. you know, you're like trying to be like really active on social media. Um, and so like learning how to adapt to that was something that you know I kind of had to do as an author um yeah you kind of have to be like like you kind of had to like have like different hats on take on different roles in the process because it's not just about the writing it's also about um doing the marketing doing publicity um doing like different events that if you're fortunate enough your publisher will send you to um yeah it's just like about like being able to like adapt a lot mm. that's something I've learned um, definitely like agree on getting thicker skin I think mm -hmm. I used to be the type of person who felt like oh if somebody doesn't like me then I have to like try to get closer to them and show them like you know I'm not a bad person <laughs> like I like want to befriend them but now like like I feel like you can't be that way as an author because you're going to get so much criticism from readers that like you can't keep publishing if like every time you get a negative review you like want to like cry or you want to reach out and be like actually like do you want to reread the book I think it's actually pretty good um yeah so Please. yeah <laughs> I think I, I just like word vomited a lot but no oh, yeah I've learned a lot a lot a lot yeah yeah career has taught me so much more than like all my years in university <laughs> it definitely teaches you how to talk to strangers oh yeah <laughs> yeah oh yeah <laughs> I think for me, um, I, I've, I'm starting trying to change my mindset from being so grateful for every little thing that 
you know, that happens to me because I, I, I think it was, it's hard for me to accept that people, you know, there are people who will like my book and that makes me like a real author and that I don't have to be so, so grateful as if like, oh my God, I'm, I'm just so thankful that you're doing this for me and I'm not ever going to dare to ask for anything more. And it's really been hard for me. So I've really been working on that to where I'm, you know, like I'm, my third book is coming out. I have more books in the works and I'm thinking, well, somebody is somebody thinks that this is something, you know, that I can pursue. It feels like everyone except me. And so I've had to really teach myself to, um, to kind of, you know, ask for things that I think I need and, mm -hmm. and I deserve. And I think that's, I mean, that's an ongoing thing. I'm still at the stage where I think like, oh my God, what if I ask too, for too much? Or what if I appear too demanding, you know? And then I'm like, you know what? I mean, if they, if my publisher, if my editors value me, then they should be open to, um, you know, open to me asking for things and, or, mm -hmm. or, you know, pushing back on things and stuff like that. So I think that's something. And also because I started so late, this career so late in my life, I have certain, like my mindset is already set, you know? And so it's, it's been stuff that I've had to work on. And I think that's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, just, you know, with, along with imposter syndrome, I, that kind of ties in with where you think like, oh, do I actually deserve any of this type of thing? And so, so that's something like I'm learning to work my way out of. And the other big thing is I've realized that people like my dog's pictures more. And like, I get more likes when I post pictures of my dog. So from now on, every book promo thing, I'm going to put my dog on there. I'm yeah. literally, I, I, I've taken pictures. My dog just came back from the groomers and I took a bunch of pictures of her and my book and she's so confused. It's how they she what's going on. But you'll be seeing like a bunch of them in the next few months because I'm like, yeah, she's so much cuter than I look and she looks so much cuter with, with my book than I look. So, And if people like my dog pictures, then, you know, they'll see the book on the site too. It's a sad reality check, but that's what it is. Lila. Oh, I already did. did I went. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I think everyone spoke, yeah. I think so, yeah. So the final question is, what are some things about your culture and your traditions and all your traditions that you haven't got a chance to write about yet, but really want to? This is a good time to um, plug in any future pro projects you might be working on or might be in the pipelines. Shall I go first? I am going to attempt, okay. I'm going to, I'm, I'm saying it here. I'm going to attempt to write a rom-com apparently did you guys know that if you write something in the 90s it's considered historical yes. <laughs> oh, no, like, probably what <laughs> my heart suffered because i'm not old but i'm historical <laughs> we all are now historical, historical. i'm but, like um, ancient history at this point <laughs> and i have to figure out how romance walked when there was no cell there were no cell phones there was no internet I can help you. Nobody had. I can help you. Well, either. So it was a lot of longing looks. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's going to be interesting. I want to talk about growing up in Fiji because that's that's that was my reality. You know, I'm going to think about my crushes. You know, being going to Muslim school, you never actually said that you had crushes. You had crushes. You looked at them. You gave them um, code names, and you talk about your friends. They're like the yellow bag. Did you see the yellow bag this morning? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> fun. So I'm looking forward to writing something fun. <laughs> How about you guys? I'm really enjoying, um, like, I'm really excited about writing fantasy um, for for younger for a younger audience for middle grade. Uh, so that's definitely something that I'm working on. But I also want to write an adult rom com mm. um, because I've been an adult for so long now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to write stuff, you know, funny stuff about that. So yeah, that's that's my thing that I'm hoping to work on. <clears throat> I am working on my fifth book, which is a YA fantasy titled Of Light and Shadow. Uh, it's going to release in May of 2023. And it's the story of a dangerous romance between a bandit and a prince who fight for justice in a corrupt world, which is inspired by 17th century India. This is basically my uh, Sholay retelling with oh. a gender bent Gabbar Singh and gender bent Basanti, except uh, in this book, they fall in love. <laughs> and this uh, <laughs> book uses a lot of uh, Zoroastrian influences in terms of themes and mythology. I am Zoroastrian by faith. Uh, my ancestors came from 
uh, Persia to India hundreds of years ago as refugees. And I have not really been able to use my faith much in my previous two fantasies, which were more based on Hindu mythology. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Um, for those who don't know, Shole is this really, really famous um, Bollywood movie. And there's this, uh, the villain of that is called Gabbar Singh. And if you have a chance, look him up because there's this one dialogue. He says, Kitne admi the, which means how many men were there, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> uh, many people use it. You know, we use it for some, some people use it as pickup lines. Some people use it just, you know, as, it's, it's hilarious. Like, you know, how in uh, Korean dramas they go, Kajima. Like that's that 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 line which is you know is um, representative. Khatima, this one is like kitne admi ta. Kitne admi ta. And uh, I've used that line in the book. I have used that line. Nice. In the book. I, I have used that line in the book. That's awesome. Oh, I, I love the kind of bursting. That is so cool. I I'm really excited for that book. Me too. <laughs> Katie, Lila. Uh, yeah, um, I, I can oh, go. Oh, Katie, go first. Yeah, oh, go first. Sorry. The Katie first. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I am basically, I'm almost done with this book. Well, I, so my agent already like looked at it and was like reading it, giving did. me comments. <laughs> Penny, it's in an adult. <laughs> yeah. Penny, I'm always keeping her, we're always keeping her busy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have to say agent for people who don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. We, and she sells everything for us. <laughs> um. Yeah, so the project I've been working on is an adult fantasy, um, and it's like very like the, the main character is loosely inspired by uh, the Chinese pirate queen, uh, Qing Shi, who I don't think a lot of people know about her. Like when you think of like pirates, it's usually like I don't know, like Blackbeard or you know the That's like true. English, That's yeah. True. yeah, like Western male pirates. Um, but she was like pretty fearsome. She was like mm. the most powerful pirate. Um, for a long time um and she like kill or no she didn't she didn't <laughs> she didn't kill her husband but he died under mysterious circumstances and he was like the pirate king and like that's how she like uh came to power and so yeah so she's like the the main that that um historical figure inspired the main character in the adult fantasy mm -hmm. oh that sounds, sounds so cool awesome. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Especially the husband disappearing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Seriously. Uh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but also a Chinese pirate queen. I mean, oh my god. That's kind of that's awesome. So yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's so. When cool. I like read about her, I was like, I, this needs to be a story. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of my culture, I feel like I've pretty much written about everything I want to write about because I I I grew up reading. Uh, I mean, I grew up watching K dramas and listening to K pop, so I always wanted to uh, write books about those two things, and which I did. Um, because I'll be the one is about K pop and flip the scripts about K dramas. Um, so I'm kind of like thinking about what I want to do next. Um, I will say, uh, seeing how popular Singles Inferno, which is like this Korean dating show, <laughs> was recently, that really inspired me to like look into reality TV more. So maybe do like a reality TV book um that's like kind of korean american i don't know i'm thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> well there seems to be lots of great stuff coming from you guys for yes. me ladies sorry ladies yeah in the future so how do we move on from here we have finished all the questions that were supposed to be asked and i believe it is 139 so it has been an hour yeah we're good yeah, well, I think so. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, everybody, thanks for <laughs> thank joining you guys. Thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun, and I'm so excited for all your books. Me too. Same. Let me stop.